My name is Alison Hawke. Thank you for coming. And we are going to be talking about power leveling the Padawans. So the first thing I want to say is thank you so much to the sponsors. And while it would have been awesome to be in Louisville today, these people have made it possible for us to have a conference that's almost as almost as good as being in Louisville with all the amazing bourbon and the fantastic people. At least the fantastic people are still here. So what is a Padawan? Well, a, according to dictionary.com, it's a learner or an apprentice. And the first time you really heard this was in Star Wars The Phantom Menace, where you meet Obi-Wan Kenobi. And you can tell he's a Padawan because he's got that nasty little thin rat tail ponytail thing going on. It is super weird. And what I'm talking about today is about power leveling them. Now, power leveling is a term from um, MMOs and online gaming, where you take someone that's a pretty low level person, and then you just boost them up to higher levels a lot faster than they could get there on their own. So they get to bypass a lot of that grinding time. So. This is an illustration of what it looks like. At the bottom line is how long it would take you to get to maybe level 10 on your own. You're grinding away, you're working at stuff, you're learning stuff, you're getting there. Things are working. But if someone's power leveling you, suddenly you just take off like a rocket. And this is a much better situation to be in. <clears throat> I've had a few people that have helped boost me onto this, this power leveling plane. And some of these people have been a huge help in personal growth and professional growth. So if you're here in this talk, you are here because you would like to be a Jedi master. You would like to mentor someone and speed them through the, the nasty swamps and get them up to being their own Jedi master. So the things I'm going to go through is why would you want to bother? How would you find your very own victim? I mean, Padawan. Um, how you do the power leveling, usually via questions and one-on-ones. And I'd like to talk about what happened with my science experiment. And right at the end, I'll give you there's a, there'll be a QR code, and it's also in this in the session chat where you can download the the links to all of the books I mentioned and uh, and you can get a link to the slides. There's also a link to the slides in the session chat if you'd like to follow along at your own comfortable Zoom level. So why would you bother with the power leveling? Well, anyone that's done any interviewing or hiring know that you've basically got two choices when you're looking at people. You can buy what you need, or you can build what you need. If you can't buy the person that you need now by hiring that exact set of skills, then you're just going to have to build it with what you've got. You get the best thing that you've got, you put some energy into it, and hope that you've got something better coming out the door. In a really tight jobs market, you're probably going to get more luck with building than buying. So <clears throat> next year, I would like to work with some really cool, smart, interesting people. And if I want to work with those people next year, I can make them this year. I can spend this year working on them to make them into those cool people. And you can either teach someone to fish, or you can fish for them for the rest of their life. Or, as the great Terry Pratchett said, if you, teach, if you make someone a fire, they're warm for a day. If you set them on fire, they're warm for the rest of their life. Isn't that more efficient? <laughs> so the science experiment that I'm going to talk about later is back in January of 2015, I hired someone with maybe about three years of experience as a, as a, as a software tester. I, I lead up, I'm one of the two directors of the software testing practice for Worldwide Technologies in the Application Services Division. So we make custom mobile apps and web apps and all kinds of interesting software. And at the time that we hired him, I had about 10 years experience in the field. And I asked him if we could do an experiment. If we take my 10 years of experience and I give you 
everything that I've learned and try and steer you around all of the potholes that I fell in, where do we end up in a year? Where do we end up in five years? And that experiment is the basis for, for doing this talk. So how you go about finding someone? I'm in a fortunate position where I'm leading a team of, right now it's 40 people. So if I want to pick someone and mentor them, I can. I have a wide variety of people to, to choose from. But you don't have to be a boss or a manager or, or a leader to mentor someone. What you really need to be is a half step ahead of them. So long as you maintain that half step gap, you're the one that knows all of the stuff and you're giving them all of the good stuff and everything's good. And honestly, all of you are a Jedi master at something. All of you have some unique skills and experiences that probably no one else on the planet, certainly no one else in your company has. And you can share that and that gives someone else a boost. And if you boost every, enough people around you, everyone rises up and you end up working with a whole bunch of cool and interesting and smart people. So a company that we've done a lot of work for, they say fail fast and in new and interesting ways. And you can teach people how to fail fast and how to recover from it and how to keep moving. So find someone that is slightly less good at something than you are and teach them how to do all of the tips and the tricks and the shortcuts that you've figured out. And while you're teaching them, you have to keep learning stuff, so it's good for you as well. You maintain that half step, you keep moving, they keep moving, and everyone sees you two moving off and then they want to move up faster. And you kind of start a rising tide of, of everyone getting better. So where are you gonna find these people? They're out there. So you interact with a whole bunch of people. There are brand new employees in your company. There are people that have moved onto your team from different teams. There are people that are just getting into the field. There are people that are interested in getting into the field. So you can find all of these people and say, would you like to join me on an experiment? That's one of the things I really love about QA. It's basically legal human experimentation because we do experiments on developers all the time and they have no idea. It's great. I mean, the number, just the drive-by trolling opportunities are amazing. So there are Padawans all the time. <laughs> yes, Amanda, I'm giving away the secrets. You can walk past a Java developer and say, oh, you're missing a semicolon there and they will be twitching for the rest of the day. It's glorious. Anyway, <laughs> once you've found a few potential people, you can ask them, do you want to join me on this experiment? And some of them will say yes, and some of them will say no. And both answers are okay. Because if you've got a Padawan that doesn't really want to play, then they're not really focused on it, and it's not going to be fun for you, and it's not going to be fun for them. So it's okay if they say no. You just need to find a different Padawan. But they are out there. You are surrounded by them. And every once in a while, you'll find someone that you're just not quite right for them. So we do an apprentice program at work, and Mary Jo was mentor for Angie, and those two just clicked. It was perfect. They were both very analytical, very, very focused, very driven, and... Mary Jo trained up Angie. Angie now is now a fantastic QA, and she is the only person I know of that can manually cause a race condition in an application when she's had a five-hour energy drink, which is why she's not allowed those anymore. But Mary Jo was placed with another apprentice we'll call Isabel, and those two just, they got along like ducks and merchant banking. Didn't quite work, and that's okay. We put Isabel with, oops, sorry. We put Isabel with a different mentor, Linda, and Linda and Isabel got on great and it was awesome. So sometimes you'll find someone that 
they really want to learn, but you're not quite the right person for them. And that's okay. At that point, your job is to help them find a better person. Or at least someone that fits them better. So once you've found your victim and they're in with this experiment, then you can start on the power leveling. And this is this is basically my, my strategy for how you power level someone. You have some really good one-on-one -on -one meetings, you drop the occasional homework assignment, and you do your level best to avoid the cloning bats. And that way, if you can navigate your way through this, then you will end up with a Jedi Master of your own at the end of it. So how do you start with good one-on-one -on -one meetings? I usually set these up for a half hour every week. And unless something came up, we would try and meet, meet every week. And then there would be Slack conversations and other stuff going on around the time. So my goal at this point was to be a coach and not a lecturer. Now, lecturers dispense big, solid blocks of information. And there isn't a lot of to and fro. Whereas a coach is more kind of inquiring and guiding and nudging. It's a lot more subtle and gentle. So when I'm in the coaching mode, I'm kind of it's like, oh, I'm asking questions. I'm trying to find stuff out. And maybe I'm offering solutions. Maybe I'm not really offering solutions. Maybe I'm just asking them to explain stuff to me. But it's not the, the I'm standing there with the stick saying, thou shalt do it my way. So there's a book by Michael Bungay Stanya called The Coaching Habit, and I've used this on people a lot. He walks you through a process of seven questions that you can ask people. And you start with a real simple one. So what's on your mind today? And they'll say something. And what they'll say isn't what's actually on their mind. They'll say what they think you want to hear. And then you deploy question number two, which is to say, and what else? And then you just kind of sit there and smile and you keep asking and what else until they run out of stuff. And if you want, if they start running out of stuff, then you just sit there and smile. And this is, this is the fun part. If you sit there and smile and just sit in your head and count, they will say something else because most people cannot stand the silence. And I'll show you what I mean right now. What's on your mind today? Uh-huh. And what else? That was just five seconds and that felt super awkward to me. How did it feel to you? I can see, I can hear the silence. <laughs> if you've got someone that can hold off until you've counted 10 in your head, you've got a really tough nut. So, the first thing, once you've figured out what the question, what the import, most important thing is to focus on, people usually say, how do I fix this? And this is the most important thing that I can tell you through this whole talk. If you know what the fix is for their problem, even if you know it, you have to sit on your hands and duct tape your hands to the, to the table and not say so especially if you know how to fix it. Because what you're trying to build is someone that can fish for themselves. So something I like to start with is to say, I don't know, how do you think you could make this better? And I've been accused of using what people have called tactical silence on them. But this is helping someone start the process of helping themselves. You can offer them books, you can offer them backup, you can offer to introduce them to the right people that know the solution, you can offer them time, but you want them to try and solve the problem first. So some more starting words you can use are, say, what are your options here? I've had people come to me with a problem, it's like, I don't know what I'm doing. It's like, there's this mammoth problem here. It's like, okay, so what are your options here? It's like, well, I could um, ignore it and I could go and sit under a bridge and live there for the rest of my life and live in a cardboard box. Okay, so that's one option. It's not a great option. What are your other options here? 
So you're working at trying to get them to figure out all of the potential options. And some of the options are quit, uh, leave your job, go and become a, a goat herder in, in Sweden. Uh, there are many potential options, but some of them are better than others. And as the Jedi Master, your job is to help the Padawan see that some of these options are going to help them and some of these options are not going to help them. So at this point, I ask a bunch of it's like, what about questions? I'm like, what about trying this? And what about, what about that thing? How are you going to work on that thing? I'm like, hmm. So I just keep asking, trying to feel out what are some more options? If I see something that's potentially useful, I might try and steer in that direction and nudge. But sometimes, really, I just want to get all of the options on the table, especially the terrible ones. It's okay to have the terrible ones. Because this is one of my other questions, is ask, what's the worst that could happen? And really, the worst that could happen is that the Earth gets hit by a meteorite. All life is is reduced to, to a fine mist. And we're basically screwed, and we miss the deadline. But once you've figured out that, that worst-case scenario, then you can make the disaster recovery plan. And once you've got that in place, whatever else happens is going to be better. So I'm a black belt in Chinese Kenpo Karate, and a lot of what we do with that is figuring out what the plan is. Like if if we can if we're in an organize if we're in a place and someone walks in with a knife, what do you do? We have a plan for that. If you're in a place and someone walks in and starts trying to grabs you by the wrist in the parking lot and tries to drag you away, what do you do with that? We've got a plan for that. If you actually have a plan for dealing with the worst case scenarios, they're not as scary because you've already gone through it in your head. So you can teach your, your Padawan how to come up with that disaster recovery plan, and it makes it a little less scary. And somewhere on the other side of the disaster reco recovery plan is the sunshine and rainbow solution. If everything goes flawlessly, what happens? Like, what is the, the best possible outcome ever? Like, oh, we, we send out some flawless software and the customer loves us, and then other customers want to come to us, and then we end up in a hiring frenzy, and everyone wants to work with us, and everything is great, and then I'll have to learn how to interview more. And it's like, okay, great. So how do we get from here, where we currently are, to there? And this is making your positive disaster recovery plan. I love the sunshine and rainbow solution and the worst case scenario, because those, those are two of the most useful questions you can ask. Now, when I started doing automated testing, I was doing Java, uh, Selenium work written in Java, and I was working on a .NET web app. So that wasn't the best solution. And my team lead said, what about the next, the next project we do? Um, you write that in C sharp, and I'll teach you. And I thought, aha, uh -huh, this is going to go well. And I would get code reviews on my automation code after we'd got it started. And it was the most awesome and horrifying and amazing and terrifying thing to happen. But I was always looking on the lookout for two specific phrases. One person in the code review would say, now, may I make a suggestion? And he would be very serious when he said that. And the other guy would say, I can make this better for you. And I knew at that point, if I said yes, they were going to refactor the living daylights out of all of my test code. And it would take me at least a half day to figure out what the heck they'd done. But it was going to be so much better afterwards. So when you're, you're mentoring someone, if they've really run out of all of their ideas and they can't think of anything and you know what the solution is and they're a long way from getting to it, ask permission to advise them. Ask permission to offer some ideas because then it makes them feel like they're in control of the process and they're not just getting lectured to you. They're kind of, they're participating in the process because you don't want them to feel like they're being just told what to do. 
that doesn't make for a good Padawan. That doesn't make for someone that will come up with those creative ideas to to work their way through a, through a problem. And the code reviews were a ton of fun. <laughs> so another one, another thing that you can do with people is you can model some healthy conflict with conversational sparring. A lot of people freak out about disagreeing because when they want to disagree with someone, it's super high stakes because like, if I don't tell the boss that we're going in the wrong direction, the company will go under, but I'm terrified of doing this and I've never disagreed with them before and I don't know how to do it and it's all, it's all, it's all stressful. So one th a gift that you can give to your Padawan is how to disagree with someone well. You give them a really low stakes place to practice it. So I would tell my, my Padawan that he needed to learn how to drive a manual transmission car because I believe everyone should drive a manual transmission car. And you really should because they're way more fun and it's the best theft deterrent. But he disagreed with me on that. And it's, it's best to tell people in advance that you're going to do this conversational sparring thing because if you just leap into it and they don't know what's going on, they kind of get a little bit freaked out. I didn't do that. I know better now. But you give some you can give them practice in how to disagree with someone in a way that's respectful and in a way that gets their point across and in a way that they can disconnect from their emotions a bit and calm down and they get to practice disagreeing. Um, another thing that we talked about was that kombucha is is the devil's urine and should never be drunk. And he disagreed me out of that one. Um, and baseball is boring. He didn't manage to manage to talk me out of that one, but we had a really good conversation about it. So this is something that not everyone knows how to do. And as the Jedi Master, you can teach someone how to disagree. And you can share the stories of times that you had to disagree with someone because what they were doing was wrong. Another thing that you can do is show people how to deal with failure. A lot of people are terrified of making a mistake because they think that that immediately leads to the living under a bridge in a box scenario. Like if I make a mistake, then I'm going to get fired and no one else is ever going to hire me and this is going to be terrible. So the way I dealt with this with my Padawan was I gave him a list of top 10 th things that I screwed up that didn't get me fired. And it was an interesting list and it was quite varied and there was a lot on it because no one really gets anything done without getting fired or without making mistakes. I haven't been fired yet, but I have made a ton of mistakes. And if you can normalize the idea that as you go through your career, you're going to screw things up. Like it's just going to happen. This is normal. Then you can give them the gift of being able to make a few experiments and try some stuff out and see whether it works and know that they're safe. If you are the boss at this point, you can reassure them that if they make a mistake, then you've got the back. You are their crap umbrella. If there may be, if there is crap raining down from on high, you are the umbrella and you will protect them from the crap. That's one of the best things you can do as a boss is be the crap umbrella. But helping people deal with failure is going back to the having a disaster recovery plan. Think about what the worst case scenario is, plan for how you deal with that and plan for how you get out of it. So, oops. Ah. Something I love doing with people when I start mentoring them is I assign a homework task and I ask them to go and watch the movie Deep Blue Sea, the original one in 1999, not the crappy remake, because the crappy remake is not very good. And when people watch this, I ask them to come back and report on me how Team Human approached things versus how Team Shark approached things. 
I love this movie. I absolutely adore crappy movies. And Deep Blue Sea is the best movie in its class, where the class is crappy shark movies that would be where the plot would be completely ruined if they'd had a decent offsite backup strategy. It's a very narrow field, but this is absolutely the best one in that field. So this is an exercise that it shows you what people pay attention to. And if you look at that movie, you learn there's a number of lessons that come out of this movie. And I see it as an allegory of the differing approach of, of waterfall software development versus agile software development. Because Team Shark, they did all of their big upfront design. They've got their plan and they execute the plan step by step by step. And one shark dies and the next shark dies and the third shark dies. And Waterfall just didn't work for them. Whereas Team Human has to operate in a much more agile fashion because they go, let's go in this one direction. No, that's flooded. Let's follow this guy. No, he just got his head bitten off by a shark. Let's go this way. Yeah, this might work. So they have to keep iterating over and over and over again. And I live in hope that someone will eventually spot this without me prompting them, but it hasn't happened yet. But if you ask people what they notice about the movie, that gives you an insight into how their head works. And some of the lessons that you get from this movie are never give an inspirational speech in a B movie because you'll get your arm bitten off by a shark. Um, there is actually an omelet recipe in this movie, if you're paying attention. And it's a good omelet recipe. Um, smoking will also get your head bitten off by a shark. That's another important lesson. Uh, do not mess with a man's parrot or you'll get blown up in a gas oven. Um, and helicopters are just problematic. Yes, three eggs and no milk for the omelet. Some people add milk for density. This is a mistake. I love that movie. So, as you're working with your Padawan, they start to get more and more proficient and they learn new things. This is when you can really have fun. And you can have a reverse one-on-one -on -one where they give, they are mentoring you. You come to the meeting and you say, you're in charge this time. This is what I'm working on and this is what I'm having trouble with. And what do you suggest I do? And the first time I did this, my Padawan just got the, the big saucer eyes of, wait, what? She said, what? I'm doing what now? And I explained what was going on. And he had a few suggestions. And they weren't what I thought of, which was good. So this is an exercise that it really builds trust. And it builds fun. By, by me being a bit vulnerable, it really built trust. And then I took his suggestions. And the next week I reported back on how it had gone. And suddenly it was like he jumped 10 levels of, I have insight into what she was doing and this worked. And I did to her what she's done to me and I could do this to someone else. And you could see the little wheel start turning. This was a huge thing in, in working with my Padawan. And I, I highly recommend it. If nothing else, you'll get suggestions that you've never even thought of before. So how do you avoid the cloning vats? I'm a nerd and a scientist. And I'm very pragmatic and logical. And I don't really do the squishy emotional stuff. And I'm not great with people because I'm an introvert. And like people are way too people-y. My Padawan, if we do, when we did the Myers Briggs test and we were like as opposite as you could get, we had, we only had one thing in common and that was the N. And my N was like this big and his was this big. So we were wildly different. What worked for me wasn't going to work for him. And a lot of the times, good ideas come from two different people have half of a good idea or Two different people have a crappy idea, but that crappy idea leads to a better idea when you compare them together. And if you get together and you're talking about stuff and you always rate their ideas down, then they're going to start to think that your way is the only way to do it. And it really isn't.
Because if everyone thinks the same, everyone looks the same, and everyone does the same stuff, it's really boring. It is. So you want to nurture those differences. So when you're comparing ideas, their ideas are just as valid as your ideas. You both have crappy ideas and you both have good ones. And one mistake I made was leading with, well, what I do here in this situation is this, and then lead out with this whole description of exactly what he had to do. And he would go back and try and do that. And it didn't really work so well because he's not me. I'm a bit of an odd duck on a good day. So you want to try and avoid making them into one of you. The other crappy model that I had to have beaten out of me was me deciding what he needed to learn, not him. Because from where I could sit, I could see, obviously, you need to work on this, this, and this. And from where he was sitting, those things were just fine, but he was worried about these things over here, which were completely different. And at this point, I had to put my ego aside and it's like, okay, let's focus on the thing that you consider most important because you're probably going to, you know, put a lot of more attention into that. And if you're mentoring your Padawan, it's about them and not you. You're the Jedi Master and you're trying to make them a Jedi Master. You're not trying to improve yourself at their expense. You're about trying to improve them. So those are pretty crappy models to work with. Cherish the differences because they're actually fun. So this is the success story. And this is the person that I was working with for the last five years. January 2015, we started doing weekly one-on-one -on -one sessions. I just hired him and I put him on one of our um, Department of Defense projects. <laughs> And then in November 2019, he became my co-director in the QA practice and neatly saving my sanity because there, were too, there was too much for one person to do and I desperately needed someone else. So somewhere along the line, his three years of experience turned into being my, my peer instead of being someone that reported to me. So how do we do that? What is step two? We started out by talking about his project, which was, it's a really detailed one. And to really feel comfortable on that project, you need to have been there about six months because there's a lot of moving parts and there's, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of technology. It's a long running project. And about a year or so in, he said, yeah, I'd maybe like to move project in about the next, sometime in the next 18 months. And I was thinking, dude, 18 months? Seriously, this is way the heck too long. And I smiled and said, I'll see what I can do about that. And what would you like to do? I'm like, well, I've never really worked on a retail project. That would be kind of interesting. And I've got some Android, so that would be interesting to work with. And like, yeah, so probably in the next 18 months, I think that would be fun. So, okay, sure. And I smiled and he learned to be careful what you wish for. Because six months later, I moved him to a brand new project, which was a retail application for a pizza company that uh, they, had a, they had an Android app and it was fairly terrible because it had been just rotting on the vine for years. And he wasn't expecting to move that quickly. Things do move faster than you, than you expect. So I moved into a new project and that really blew him out of his comfort zone. And at that point, he, he really started accelerating his learning and getting into all, all kinds of things that he hadn't done before. And while I was working with him, I had to deal with some of my own issues as well, because I'm, I'm someone that really likes the eye contact. I've had a real hard time with this while we've been in the pandemic of, I, there is no eye contact, it's difficult. And this particular person tended to look away while I was talking to him. And I was like, is he not paying attention to me? Is he, is he not listening? Is he not, what's going on here? Does he not want to be here? Does he want to be somewhere else? 
And I had to adjust my expectations of, no, he is actually paying attention. We're having a good conversation. He just doesn't look at me. Okay, this is weird, but that's his thing. This is my thing. And I had to learn a new signal of, there was something that he did that I could see his, his eyes would get kind of red and, and that was the signal that Ben has feelings going on right now and something that is, that is happening is important to him. I never encountered someone like that. I'd never dealt with someone that they didn't look you in the eye and they just like, it was so bizarre. So something that we learned in this process was sometimes you just have to give someone permission to do something that they know that they need to do it. Um, one time he turned up in a, in a flat panic of, I have made a huge mistake. And this, in his head, this was a job threatening, massive screw up. This was a, I'm afraid to even tell you this because I'm, I'm ashamed of this mistake and I can't believe I did this. And I sat down, it's like, what's on your mind? Tell me about this mistake. And we talked about it. And actually it wasn't that huge of a mistake. I mean, it wasn't great but it was fixable. So we figured out the disaster recovery plan and he was clearly twitchy. So it's like, okay, we've got the disaster recovery plan, go forth and do the thing. Right? You know what to do, go and do the thing. And sometimes you just have to give people permission to do the thing that they know that they need to do. When I was prepping for this conference, um, I told my boss, I was, I was nervous because I, I didn't feel like I'd had enough time to prepare. So she said, okay, what do you need? I'm like, well, I've got two talks and I probably need about a day's work on each of them. And, you know, I, I guess I need two days without meetings to get this done. And she smiled and she said, okay, what days next week are you taking to work on this? And it was a revelation of, oh crap, I can do this. I have permission to do the thing that I know that I need to do. So sometimes you just have to give people that common sense nudge of that thing that you know that you need to do, go and do the thing. It's okay. You can do the thing. You have permission to do what makes sense. So another huge step of being vulnerable was a couple of times I sent him home because he had a, um, a back issue that was just bugging him and he needed to go home and, and stretch and sort it out. And I hate crying at work. It just something in me, I just absolutely despise it. And one November, my 15 year old cat, who was very sick, we had to take her to the vet and that was, that was her last day. She was done. And I came into work after that and I was just crying at the drop of a hat and went to my one-on-one. -on -one. That was one of the reasons I'd gone into work was because I knew that I had that one-on-one. -on -one. And we sat down and he knew that there was something wrong and he sent me home. My, my Padawan and the guy in the work structure that reports to me sent me home. When's the last time you sent your boss home? That was another one of those trust building exercises that I knew that we were in, on a good path that we'd built that amount of trust. And we did a lot of, uh, we did several book studies as well, where we would read the same book and we both, I confess we did the thing where you highlight and you take notes and we actually wrote in the book and that offends my librarian soul terribly, but we did it. <laughs> but we would swap them and see what the other person had highlighted and what had stuck out to them and what they were paying attention to. And it was never the same thing. It was very rare that we were actually paying attention to the same thing. Um, we read uh, Seneca's Letters to a Stoic. We read Steal Like an Artist by um, Austin Cleon. We read the, the Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson. And those were fantastic books that we learned about communication, we learned about leadership, and we learned about trust. And it worked. It built relationship. 
he learned what was in my head and got some of that 10 years of experience out. And I learned what was in his head and learned how you look at things from much more of the, the squishy emotional side of things that I'm really not good at and he's fantastic at. I firmly believe that shared food is the basis of civilization as we know it. If you can have lunch with someone, it's a lot harder to be miffed at them. So when we were working in the office, it was it was known that I drive a manual transmission car. I have a Mazda 3 hatchback, 2.5 litre fuel injection, six speed transmission, and I drive it like it's a stolen Ferrari and I love it. It was, it was kind of a rite of passage for people. It's like, oh, you're going out to lunch with Allison. Make sure you put your seatbelt on. But that was another aspect of the mentoring process was I showed him that um, that side of my, my personality that didn't come out in work. You know, there's something very soothing about just redlining the RPMs while you're screaming around a corner at 60 miles an hour. It just, it's... It's very relaxing to me. So I would recommend if you're mentoring someone, you start it out with coffee and then every couple of months you have lunch together because it builds the relationship and you get to see a completely different side of someone. So at the end of the day, you are training your Padawan to become a Jedi master themselves. And part of that teaching them to become a Jedi master is showing them how to do the thing that you just did to them. Something I read said that you not can't really consider yourself a leader until someone that you've taught to be a leader has trained someone else to be a leader. And the process of watching that happen is just so much fun because they never do it the way that you expect them to do and they do it completely differently to you and it still works. So as the Jedi master, you are building the people that you want to work with in the next six months, in the next year. And that improves, it improves your team, it improves your company, it improves you because you have to keep developing in order to keep showing people how they can develop themselves in the process, instead of just constantly handing them a fish, you're teaching them to fish for themselves, which is a really gratifying thing to watch because after a while they start teaching other people how to fish. And then you don't have to fish for those other people either, which is awesome because then you can go off and do the more fun stuff. And when you do some reverse mentoring where they mentor you, that gives them the tools that they need so that they can train their Padawan when they're ready for it. So this is my cat, TJ Max Planck, in his favorite TARDIS blanket. I said there would be a kitten picture at the end. And if you didn't get the links from the chat session chat, you can take a picture of this QR code and that will take you to a GitHub gist which is a text file with links to the books, the movie reference, but not the omelet recipe. All right, I am going to stop sharing my screen there. That is the end of what I had prepared for you. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to talk about? while I quickly grab my tea. Tracy, I'd forgotten that I inflicted my driving on you. <laughs> oh, mentoring failures. Gosh, yes. Why, yes, I do. Um, there was a guy that I was talking to where the things that I was talking to him about were not the things that he wanted to listen to. Um, I was talking to him about ways to be a servant leader and ways to um, improve himself as a developer and ways to be a team lead and try to work him towards 
the process of going from a developer to a team lead to maybe to a technical architect. And after a few sessions, it didn't seem to be landing right. And I said, is this useful to you? And he said, no. And I was a little bit taken aback. I was like, okay, um, what would be useful to you? What is it? What is your goal? What is your end, end process? And we talked for a bit and this particular person's goal was to get to a point where he had a billion dollars in the bank. That was his goal. And I said, I don't know how to get you there. And I would recommend that you find someone that can talk to you about those kind of things, because that is not something I have experience of. And I don't have a billion dollars in the bank. And I don't know that I want a billion dollars in the bank. So we, we stopped talking and I think he found someone else to work with, but I, I felt kind of miffed about that. And I had to, I had to get over it because I was not the right person to be mentoring him. And I tried and it didn't help. And I, I wish him the best, but I can't help you with that. <laughs> Did that answer your question, Dustin? And that was a really good question. Cool. I should have asked him up front what, what his end goal was. I, I didn't do that. I thought that he wanted to work on the things that I, I thought he should work on, and I was wrong. Does anyone else have any questions? It's probably not the only one that I've had a mentoring failure with, but he's the one that springs out right now. When new people join the company, they they usually set up one-on-ones with me for a bit. Oh, who are my mentors now? That's a great question. So one of the people is, she used to be one of my peers and then she got promoted to a senior director level. Her name is Rose. And she is a former fashion designer. She's a former developer. She has this wide career. She's been a DJ. She's toured with a rock band and she is extremely good at the strategic level stuff that I'm really not that good at because I'm, I've spent most of my experience at the, at the tactical boots on the ground, hands in the mud kind of level. So I'm learning a lot from Rose about how to think about my, my team at a more strategic level. Now, someone else is a lady called Joy, who is one of our senior executive team and from her, I'm learning a lot about the, a lot about mindfulness and how you do performance management stuff and what people are looking for from, from their leadership, really. Um, she does a lot of direction and, and care and feeding of our performance managers, which is a, a kind of player coach level. And she's, she is not like me at all. She is much more in touch with her feelings and, and yeah, we, we, we have some really good conversations. Um, past mentors are probably a couple of, uh, gentlemen, Tom Holt and John Royal that were team leads at my previous companies. And from Tom Holt, I learned that if you're the boss, you are absolutely the crap umbrella. You defend your people and you protect them and you keep them safe and you work for your people because he did all of that for us and all of his team loved him and we would have gone to the ends of the earth for him. And um, the same with John Royal too. He was another one that really looked after his team. Ooh, what about people who want a mentor but haven't found one? And how do you look for a mentor? Well, for me, um, I walked around the company and I opened a couple of doors and said, hey, I'm kind of new to this management stuff and I don't know what I'm doing. Can you show me how to not screw up? And I asked that of the CFO and <laughs> he said, oh, I would love to teach you that. Um, you can do a broadcast on Twitter. I've seen someone say, like, I am looking for a mentor. How I am looking for someone that can teach me on these about these things and how would I, I would like to talk to someone. Um, I'm happy to talk to people about some of the stuff that I've done. Um, 
I I came into the company as a senior QA and then I got promoted to director and I grew the team from eight people up to 45. And honestly, I'd never had people before and I was terrified of screwing it up. And I did not know what I was doing. And I went into this deep dive of, I need to find all of the books and I need to talk to all of the people and I need to find people that know what they're doing. And I'm terrified and I don't want to screw this up. And I tried to be, I tried to be the boss that I wanted to have. So Christopher, I just, just putting up the flag and saying, Hey, I am interested in this thing. And I would like someone to mentor me. That's good at this thing. If you go to someone and say, Hey, I saw that I see what you do and I admire what you do. And I would like to learn from you because you have more time doing this thing than I have. And I want to know what potholes you fell in so that I can avoid falling in those and fall in different ones. Because it's really all about just falling in, in different potholes. You are guaranteed to fall in potholes. This will happen. I promise you that. But maybe you can fall in different ones that are less bad than they fell into. I My goal is to steer people into the, the, the new piece of, of road where maybe there are less potholes. Does that answer your questions, Christopher and Dustin? Does anyone else have any questions? Fabulous. Well, you have been a wonderful crowd and I really like the, the chat system. I never had this before when I've, when I've done conferences. It's always been the standing up front and this, this scary sea of people. But I like, I like the back and forth. This is really good. Um, if anyone would like to chat with me about any of this and they're interested in mentoring, hit me up on Twitter. I love talking to people. I'm way better at doing the one-on-one -on -one thing because I'm an introvert and I don't like people. <laughs> I, I really am. So thank you all for coming. I'll be around here for a, a little bit if you want to keep chatting and feel free to hop in on the moderation panel and we could have a have a face to face. And Christopher, thanks for being my moderator for the day. Happy to help. Thank you. And I wore my science experiment t shirt too. Ah, see, that was the first thing that I noticed, and I loved it. <laughs> Very much loved it. Yesterday I also was not surprised. I wasn't surprised to see the TARDIS blanket with your cat as well, because I, I've loved Doctor Who since I was young, and I can always tell when someone else is likely to like it as well. Mm -hmm. I grew up hiding behind the sofa from Daleks, and oh. my first Doctor was the fifth Doctor, and I have oh. always been a Doctor Who fan. <laughs> I haven't seen, I don't think I've seen nearly enough classic who. Science with a C. Uh, it's been, um, it's been, like, I, I think that I've watched, I've watched enough of, oh goodness, what is his name now? Baker. I've watched enough of oh, his. Baker. Full Doctor. Yes. Which, but it's funny, my first, is it Tom Baker? It is Tom Baker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my first experience with him was not Doctor Who. It was the old BBC Narnia series. With him oh, as Pope. Yes, I remember that. And I remember as a kid, my first time hearing, was, it was the fourth Doctor, right? Yeah. Yeah, my first time hearing his voice, I sat there for 20 minutes. My parents were just looking at me like, why do you have that face on your face? And I'm like, I know this voice. I just, I know this voice. And I figured it out like five days later. It was like a week until I realized like, oh my goodness, and went back and matched it. Um, I've always had a really good relationship with Dr. Who, yeah. Hey, I, I like Fifth Doctor because he's so, he's so idealistic and he wants to save the world. And then Seventh Doctor is such a devious, manipulative bastard, but you love him anyway. <laughs> oh, you'll have to remind me. Um, Sylvester McCoy. Yaha, yeah, okay, I can see that. I know enough of the characters <laughs> there. Yeah, yeah. So um, what would you say is your, is your favorite c contemporary Doctor? That's a tough one. I liked Eccleston, but I'm really liking Jodie Whittaker. Mm, I agree. The, the mm -hmm. first season was all like, oh, 
oh, we've got a female doctor, isn't it wonderful? And then they kind of settled down and started telling actual stories, and it's much better. Yes, that is, I actually have not seen, I have, I'm still on her first season, but even then I'm still enjoying, it's a fresh take. I'm very much enjoying that. Yeah. But, um, um the, no, go ahead. Dustin, the, the decorative celery actually comes in useful in, um, I think it's the, the Caves of Androzani. Okay. I don't think I've reached that yet then. Yeah, my my doctor was um my my first doctor that I was watching were coming out. I think we've lost Christopher. Oh no! I it. I didn't like it when they were constantly relying on the sonic screwdriver. That that made me sad. It was like, oh, look, we're in a terrible situation, but I can just press a button on the sonic and everything's right now. Yeah. I think that was one of my favorite parts of, of Star Wars when Han Solo says, oh, it's fine. We're just going to zoom out of here. And he puts the thing down and the engine sort of just sort of makes that chug, chug, chug <laughs> a noise. <laughs> I can't even at the end of that. Um, Han Solo, when when he puts the, puts the thing down to zoom out of there and the engine just craps out on him. Bye, Jonathan. Good luck. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. And... I'm on Twitter as British Koala T. Say British quality, it sounds much much better. Oh, I can't spell British. Never mind. But this has been an awesome talk and an awesome audience. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for the good questions. Oh, there it is. Sorry, I dropped out on you there. No worries. I was going to say, I very much enjoyed the talk, and um, I just enjoyed getting to speak with you, so I'm really happy that I was paired with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And hit me up if you ever want to chat. Absolutely. I was planning on, I was planning on following. Uh, is that your Twitter handle as well there? Yeah, it helps if I spell it right. Yeah, that yeah, spells right. right. Okay. I'll be sure to connect then. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, right. Pete. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.